All right, guys. If I saw this, I'm looking at practice test or practice final. Here's my take on number 17. Solve the equation, got to get the bottoms to match. I'd probably factor them first. This looks like m times m is m squared. m plus, if I have to times the 12, it add up to 4. It's a negative 12, though, so m plus 6, m minus 2 should probably do it. I'm going to try and make that a little bit more succinct looking. m plus 6, m minus 2. Or that's looking bad. And then over here, I'm noticing that those two bottoms, they already mo both match. But then over here, this bottom, it almost matches. You know, it has the M minus two part, but it doesn't have the M plus six part. So if I were to try and make those match, well, these two already match. This one just needs an M plus six. So I'll give it an M plus six, and then I'll give it one on top as well. Now all the bottoms match. And then once the bottoms match in an equation like this, I don't need the bottoms anymore. We could pretend like we're just timing the bottoms out or something. And then essentially we just get to solve the tops, you might remember it. So we have four equals, just looking into the tops, four equals one on top plus one times of n plus six. And that's all we'll need to solve at that point, you know. And so then let's see, you're distributing the one times m plus six, that'll be four equals one plus one m, or just m plus one times six is six. One and six make a seven. So I could say m plus seven equals four. Minusing that out, we have m equals like a seven, you know, four minus seven is negative three. Then as long as that doesn't plug in to make us undefined on any of these fractions or something, we can keep the answer m equals negative three. It looks like we're okay because the only bad news answers would be, well, positive two would make m minus two bad news. Whoa, something going on. And then m plus six, negative six would be bad news. So negative three is not bad news, so we can keep it. Looks like we got a good solution. Okay, that's my take on that one. Um, on number 18, we have to find an inverse here. So remember how that goes, call it a y and then switch them. So now we have x equals y plus two to the third and then take away three. And then we'll just solve away. I'll probably get the plus three over here to get rid of that minus three. And now we have y plus two to the third equals x minus, or sorry, equals x plus three. Getting rid of that third power, we can three root both sides here. So now we have three root, three root, wham, wham, and then y plus two. Almost got y by itself at that point. y plus two equals cube root of x plus three. And then minus the two off and we'll be good. And so we'll just put a little minus two there and we'll be good. And it'll look something like f inverse or g inverse or whatever it was, g inverse of x equals all this stuff and then minus two. So cube root of x plus three all in the cube root and then minus two not in it because that happens after the cube root. This would be my take on that. <clears throat> and then let's see here. F of n equals four over n plus one, then plus one. So if we had that, let's see how that would go. We y that one and then you know, you can call this an X or an N or whatever you want, and then we'll switch them. And so now we have, I guess I'll use the N's that they have. We'll just have N and Y, that's weird, but whatever. And then, um, oh yeah, so then we we'll have N equals four over Y plus one, plus one, pull on the switch. Then it's a lot like the last one to start, you get rid of that plus one, you know? So we'll have just N take away one equals four over, you know, over y plus one, <clears throat> not plus four. And then it's weird having the y on the bottom of a fraction. Even if I get rid of the one and the four, I at that point don't really have y by itself because it'll be like a y on the bottom of something. It won't be a y as a whole number. And so what I recommend is just timesing this y plus one over this side. You know, I have y plus one over here. Ta-da, you know, I mean, technically we're timesing it on both sides, but they cancel over here. So now we have just a four over there equals y plus one. So y there, y plus one times n minus one. And then you could foil this all out, but I think that'll make things worse instead of better. What I'd recommend since we want to get y by itself is just divide the n minus one now. Now he's the one that'll be on the bottom of the fraction. 
And then we almost have y by itself because the y plus one is still sitting there. You have y plus one equals four over n take away one. And then y, y plus one to get the y by itself, you just minus the one and we're good, you know? Now we got four over n minus one, take away one, looking good. And that's our inverse here. So you just call it f inverse equals f mass. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> Clear all drawings. Let's see if we can scroll this. Oh, I'm still annotating this, right? There you go. All right. They cut people in the background. <laughs> oh, well, we'll just keep working. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Where's that? Where's the? Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. So, number 20 here. <clears throat> Rewrite it in log a logarithmic form. We have an exponential form equation here. So this just means for us, we're gonna say the base number is still the base number. If we're starting from 112, then we're starting from 112. So log base of 112. And then remember how it goes, it kind of pulling the switch. Log base this of that equals the power, you know? And so log base 112 of one out of 144 equals two is how we say it. So the power ends up being the exponent is our output. It's not the input that gives me an answer. It's the output that is the answer, you know, now is the emphasis there. <coughs> now I evaluate each logarithmic expression we're looking at here. Sorry, I should probably go ahead and here. Let me pause the recording so I can mute the phone here. Keeps on going off. Back in action, 21, we have to evaluate the logarithmic expression. We're just saying log base five of 25 equals what? You know, like to evaluate means give me a number for an answer. So we're like equals what? Remember, we're saying log base five of 125 is saying five to what power makes 125? And so five times five is 25 times another five is 125. So that's three of them. And that's the power we're looking for. Log base five of 125 equals three because five to the three is what it takes to get 20, 25. So looks like equals three. They say evaluate it. You don't need to say X or anything equals. You're just saying, I got the answer for you. It's three. That's the value that you're looking for, you know, or the number you're looking for. So each equation we have, um, probably we could do like basis property on this one. This is a nine and a three and I'm, <clears throat> I'm noticing on this stuff that, well, nine is a power of three and three is a power of three. So we could certainly view them both being that way. So nine being a power of three, that's three to the two. And then with this weird negative B plus one thing sitting there on top of that. And then, so that's a three to something. And now this is also three to something, you know, and that'll be good. And then remember, if I have a power on top of a power, we can times them. So now I have really that's going to be three to the and then times them two times of negative B plus one power equals three to the four power. From there, it's like, you know, with the bottom to be in the same in a fraction kind of a thing, you might remember we can say we can solve this without the basis at this point. And we'll just solve it from there being like, well, the two times of negative B plus one is equal to just the four. Now, just the powers are, they have to be equal if these expressions are equal. And then solve it any old way. We can distribute this through is what a lot of people would like to do, although you could divide the two as well, it's whatever. Anyway, so negative two V minus two equals four, and then we're solving, 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 you know, four plus two is six and we'll divide it and we'll call it a day. I'm getting negative three by the time I divide that in there, negative two into six, you know, okay. <clears throat> Next one, number 23, we have log base 11 of this equals log base 11 of that. You might remember by the same kind of property, very similar logic. Well, that means that 2a plus 10 must be the same thing as 4a plus 8. So we just saw that 2a plus 10 equals 4a plus 8. Wham. Let's see if I minus the 8 over there and minus the 2 over there. Minus 8 gone. Minus the 2a over here gone. Then we have 10. Minus eight is two equals two a, so a must equal one is what I'm thinking there. All right, and then next one, a little bit weirder logarithmic deal. 
<clears throat> we have logarithmic equation to be solved. What I would say here is I can translate a log equation into a, an exponential equation. If I get this extra five out of there somehow, you know, if I can just view that in another way. So fortunately it goes into 15, so this won't get real messy real fast. We'll divide that out. And now if five into 15 is three times. So the log expression or the log version of this equation right now in simplified form is log base seven of B minus eight equals three. And then we could say, well, it's gonna be hard to solve for the B inside of the middle of a log like that. Let's try and put this in exponential form. So, and again, this is not the only way to do it. This is just what I like to do. And so um, in exponential form seven to the three then, equals b minus eight. This is probably the quickest way I can think to do it for sure. You know, and so then from there, we'd say, yeah, anything else might be a little bit funny, but whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> bam, plus the eight on there. And now we have b equals whatever seven to the third is plus eight. I think that's 343 plus eight. So assuming that I'm getting my numbers right, I think that's 343 plus eight. You know, so that's whatever that is, 351 or something like that. Cool. All right, and then condense to a single logarithm, something like this, what I'm seeing is, well, let's see here. It'll be hard to condense these to a single logarithm if they have stuff dancing around them. So the two and the 12 probably have to go and so remember how that goes. If number timesing out in front of a logarithm could also be a power inside of a logarithm. So I could think of that two log four of u as being log base four of, hold up. All right, I paused it for a long time and I can't remember how I had left off except to know that I was on this problem. And we had talked about putting this exponent up here in the u. So it would be like log base four of u squared would be another way to write that expression. And then the same thing, instead of 12 times the whole log, we could put that as a power of the v inside of it. And so log base four of, what's a four there, of v to the 12 power. Not necessarily getting any better looking, actually looking worse if you have to take weird 12 powers of things in some ways, you know, it's worse. but. What it gives us is an opportunity to condense this into a single log because now they're both log base four of something and they're plusing together. And plus is like times when you're condensing logarithms. So now we can say, well, a plus of two logs is like a times of their innards, you know, log base four of, and now it's a times of their innards here, u squared v to the 12. That's probably what we're looking for here. Okay. Now solve each equation down here. It's an exponential equation. If I saw this one, we'll plus the 2.4 and divide the six to get it to where it's just 11 to some power equals something, then I'll probably go logarithmic form. So 22 plus 2.4 is 24.4, whoops, 0.4. And then divide that six out, you know, divide the six. So we're talking about 24.4 over six. We can divide that if you like, or else, have, that being a six, it's not going to divide very well into that. It'd be a nasty decimal. So I'm just going to leave it like some weird looking fraction thing. And then from there, we'll say, let's see here. We have, oh, oh no. Okay. As we were. Somebody walked in. Anyway, so now we got all this stuff. So this is 11 to the X minus one power now equals this big old fraction mess. And again, you can divide it if you like, but it makes a nasty old decimal, so I wouldn't recommend it. You'd have to round it off too early on if you did that. Anyway, so then from there, some people will take a natural log of both sides at this point. I like to just translate it into logarithmic form. And so this would be log base 11 of this equals that. Remember, base of that equals this, or sorry, log base this of that equals the power. So. Okay, now we have log 11, log base 11 of 24.4 over six equals X minus one. And that means, I mean, this would be easy to get the X by itself. We'll just plus the one and then we can use the calculator for the rest. And so plusing the one over there, what we have is log base 11 of this big old mess, 24.4 over six 
all that plus one. If your calculator can handle doing that, then shoot that through the calculator. If it can't, then what you might do is use the change of base formula to make it look better. I'll put that up here. Remember, change of base formula is common log or any log that you want, but we normally go with common logarithm. Uh, 24.4 sixths over a common log of 11. So log 24.46 over log 11, and then all that plus one. Then run it through a calculator and you'll be as good as gold. Okay, let's see here. Boom. Jill invests a bunch of money in a retirement account, 9% annual interest rate fixed, compounded continuously. Because sometimes this is a fixed interest rate. Sometimes they have this, these loans and things or in this case, an investment account where it's variable or whatever, you know. Anyway, so then what will the account balance be after 18 years? So we're compounding this continuously. Remember, that means you're not doing it just some number of times a year. It's a million times every second. And so you can certainly approximate that by doing the old fashioned, like this times one plus, and then you do 0 0.09 and then just divided by a million into a million pieces, you know, and then take it to the million power times 18. So 18, I'm going to put 18 M for 18 million up there. Power, that would work and it would get you, you know, probably within the nearest cent. So that's a pretty good approximation. Uh, our classic way of handling it that's more accurate is just using the old, you know, our definition of E. And so we'd say this is E to the, 2.2527 times e to the, you know, whatever. And then the only things that are not accounted for in e are the 9% in the 18 years. And so both the little smoke and mirrors, we can account for that up here in the power of e. And so whatever 0 0.09 times 18 is, I think that's 1.82, if I remember right, that'll be your exponent. Or you can just, if you have, are good enough for that stuff, leave it as a times problem in the power, you know if you know how to keep both of those things as an exponent. Anyway, and then it's calculator work. And then it's a bunch of money, you know. Okay, and then let's see your stop the annotation for a second. Scroll in. Whoa, whoa. Uh, I'll have to go with this, whatever, okay. So bam, bam. Okay, identify the vertex, focus, axis of symmetry, directrix of each then sketch it. So with this thing we have, um, you know, it's a parabola, it looks like. We have only the X part squared, not the Y part. And so if that's the case, if only one of the variables is squared, it indicates we have a parabolic kind of a thing, either a UE or like a, a sideways thing or something. And so remember if it's Y equals X squared, then it's an up or a down. If it's x equals, and then the y value is the one that's squared, then it's a left or a right, you know? And so then, and of course we know the difference between an up and a down is if we have a positive on our, um, on our coefficient on the outside versus a negative standing there timesing something. And the same thing here, we you know, default to the right for positive and then it'll go to the left for negative if you have a negative timesing out in front. We can see there's a negative number of times you got in front here as our, um, I guess we'll just call that a coefficient of some kind. So that being the case, it's gonna be either a negative for downhill or a negative for sideways. It's definitely one of the negative ones, but we'll narrow it down more than that because it's Y equals, and then the X part is the one that's squared. So if it's the X the one that's squared, it's not any of these. This is for the X is the one being squared. It's either an up or a down. And since we know we see a negative sitting out in front, it must be a downward one. So we're expecting some kind of a downward hyper, sorry, parabola thing going on. We don't know exactly where it is. And so we'll draw it better later, but some kind of a downhill one, probably not as slanty tilted as that last one, but you know, whatever, anyway, something like that. And so then to get particulars on it, we need to know where the vertex is. Matter of fact, I probably shouldn't draw that in yet. So let's see here. We'll get the vertex because we can draw that into place as we go. Okay, let's find the vertex. And that's just a matter of new zeros. That's new zero is negative five and new zero is positive one, or sorry, negative one for the Y value. So negative five, negative one, where's five, negative five, 
negative one. Here's our vertex. And then the number of steps we have to go to find the focus in the directrix um, is going to be determined by the number that's timesing out in front here. Now you'll notice, of course, that there's no number there. It's just a negative. But you guys will remember that that's a one if there's no number there. We know that this being a negative, it's going to be some kind of a downhill parabola. And I'm going to approximate it like this by just drawing a downhill parabola from the vertex that we found. But we should also mention, well, where in the world is this directrix and where's the focus? We know that since it's a downhill parabola, the focus would be down inside it somewhere. So it'll be down from that point here, our vertex B, I'll put a B for vertex, is at negative five, negative one. And there's that dot. So the, the focus here, I'll put F for focus, focus dot, well, we know it's also gonna be over negative five because it's the same amount of steps over. We just don't know how far down it is, you know? And so we'll figure out the steps here. And then the directrix will be that same number of steps going uphill. It'll just be up here a little bit from the negative one. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, but I need to know the number of steps. And so if I were to do that steps here, Remember how this goes, the number of steps to get to the focus and to the directrix is gonna be the same and it's defined by this number up here. There's something to do with a 4a or whatever if you do it formulaically or else we can just say, here's the number negative one and then you know the one that's timesing with, it's our coefficient that's timesing with the non-squared side and we just divide it by four. And then negative one divided by four is a negative 0.25, you know. Uh, if you're doing this by formula, that negative is probably important for us. It's mostly important that we know how big the step is because we're going to be geometrically figuring out what direction to go. And so we have that's a quarter of a step going downhill, you know. And so we were already at negative one at the focus here, or sorry, at the vertex. So now we're just going another fourth of a step down. Really, our focus is like right there. It's barely any lower at all. So it's, it's a fourth of a step going down. So if I'm already at negative one, you know, for one step down, <coughs> excuse me, at the vertex, then doing another fourth of a step down would be negative one and then negative 0.25 as well. So that's negative 1.25, negative 1.25, or you can do that in fractions if you like, that's negative one minus one fourth. To go downhill, it's always minus, right? And so, if I'm going downhill, I'll minus the one fourth and that's negative one and one fourth, or you could call it by getting the bottoms the same and be like, well, I'll just I'll make sure the bottoms match, I'll times this by four and then it becomes four times one is negative four over four minus one over four is negative five fourths. And I think that's the way they have it in your answer book or in the answer key here is negative five fourths is another way of writing negative 1.25. Because fractions can be you know, more handy. They're more versatile, I guess, than decimals at times, even though they're not as user friendly. And then the directrix, that is the same number of steps above. And so in this case, we're at down one step. Here is how far down we are. And we need to go up one fourth of a step. So if you're going up, you're plussing it on. So that's plus one fourth or plus two five. And that ends up being in decimal form, negative one plus 0.25 is, point, is 0 0.75. I put the O in the wrong spot. This is a negative 0.75, but in fraction land, that's gonna be negative one over one, and you times them by fours, so they become four over four negative. Negative four fourths plus one fourth is negative three over four, and that'll be our Y value of the directrix is negative three fourths of a step, just barely above the negative one mark. And so there's that, and that'll be y value of negative three fourths. That is our, whatever we just call it, directrix. Let me clean this up a little bit, and then we'll mention the axis of symmetry real fast as well. The axis of symmetry is a line, just the same. But the axis of symmetry line is the one that splits it down the middle. And so splitting the uprights here, we have that we were five steps to the left. Yet remember the vertex was five over and one down. There was our vertex. And our axis of symmetry is split that right down the middle. 
So for that one, we just say, well, what we know about this is that the X value of it is negative five. You can go up and down from there, and no matter what dot you pick, the X value is negative five. So that is our axis of symmetry for this kind of a parabola. Looking good. And again, unless you're super good at doing formulas and knowing which way is sideways and how to deal with it when it's going whichever way, I'd recommend drawing as you go and just handling it in a geometric fashion. Uh, but this is not the only way to do it. It's what, just what I recommend. Okay, let's see, clear that up. Stop the annotation. Let me pause this. I think I hear something out there. And back at it. And I already changed the screen up a little bit. So we have find um, the standard form of the, the circle here, equation here. And so if we're given a center at 14.0 and a radius of five, you might remember there's a pretty quick go to on this. So without even getting into the Pythagorean theorem stuff, we could say this is like x minus zero. No, sorry, x minus 14, because the 14 is the x part. x minus 14 squared plus y minus zero squared equals five squared. And then just clean it up a little bit, you know. x minus 14 squared is pretty cleaned up. I wouldn't do anything with that probably. But y minus zero is just y. So you could just call that y squared. And then equals, you could leave this as five squared if you want to emphasize the fact that it's a radius of five. Or you could just put 25 because that's what five squared evaluates to. So this is a pretty good cleaned up version of it. It's also okay to leave this as being five squared if you like, it's whatever. Cool. Now, next deal. Identify center and all these things. We have an ellipse going on here because it's an X squared and a Y squared. X part is squared and the Y part is squared. It's kind of a funny looking ellipse. So we'll make sure that we emphasize this well. Um, and it's a plus part in between. And that's how we know it's an ellipse and not a hyperbola or something. There's nothing going negative involved. Now, remember, if it's an ellipse, normally we have a fraction for both. So we'll just put this over one and that'll remind us about the steps going in each direction. So we have from here, let's see, um, for the vert or sorry, for the very center of this thing, remember it's like new zero and new zero. And that's also weird because this is dot X plus, it's not X plus something or X minus something. It's just X. And so that means the new zero is just zero. And then something minus four makes zero, the Y value would be positive four for a new zero there. So now we have zero and then positive two, three, four, positive one, two, three, four, there you go. Is the center of our ellipse. And then the, the number with the x's tells us the x steps to go, and the number with the y's tells us the y value steps to go. So I see 25, but I'm thinking 5 squared. I see a 1, and I'm thinking 1 squared is 1. So from there, we'll say for the x's in left and right direction, I'm taking five steps, you know? So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's how stretched out it is, left and right radius, sort of. And then one step up and down, up one, down one. And we have this kind of a funny looking ellipse going on. And then due to some geometry that we covered in class one day, I guess I could keep that drawing even though it looks bad. Due to some geometry stuff we talked about the other day and the algebra that's related, we know the foci are in here somewhere, but there's a property about it which says that if I had used the string technique, where it's like the amount of string to get from here out to the edge and then to the other one, blah, blah, blah. It's the same as the amount to get from the center out to the edge and then back to the center. Whatever, all that, um, the quick take on it, remember, is if I want to figure out the number of steps to get to the focus, we could say, bam, bam, let's see, that'll be the same distance as that then. So then long and short of it is to say the number of steps that I have going outward essentially ends up being if I were to draw a triangle that goes out here and it comes back and then I started looking at a right triangle in the middle of it there. It turns out that this distance here, that's my five, which is the five steps going the big direction is the same as the hypotenuse if I were to draw a right triangle um, go in the little direction and making a right triangle out of it, you know, from the focus over and up and stuff. Anyway, all that to say, I have five steps going sideways 
and then I have one step going up and down. So by Pythagorean theorem, I know that since those two, that sideways distance matches the hypotenuse here, I could say the some number of steps to get to the focus, I don't know, but I know that if I, I'll call that F steps, I'll take that focus steps plus the one step that it takes to go upstairs, one squared, it equals the five steps, five squared steps that it would take to go on the hypotenuse, which is the same as the distance that it would take to get all the way at the edge. Anyway, so one squared, you can use these from these if you want to just get a shortcut on it, if you're getting too permeated with things to remember. You can just say focus squared equals, or focus squared plus the little one squared equals the big one squared, you know, works every time. Um, and that's where some of our formulas come from, you know, there's a reason that those formulas exist because they do give you a shortcut at some point, you know, even though it's hard to wrap your mind around why they work and stuff if you just use it as a shortcut. Anyway, so from there, um, we have F squared plus one equals 25 and then F is going to equal the square root of 24. And so what that means is that's the number of steps it takes to get to the focus from wherever you are at the center. And so I'm going to clear up this drawing a little bit. What that means for us guys is, oh my goodness, looks like I'm gonna clear it up too much. I might not be able to clear this drawing up. Okay, so that means we'll take it from wherever our center point was and we know where that was. That was at, I don't remember. It was at zero, negative four or something. Yeah, no, zero, positive four. There was our center. I'm gonna switch colors to emphasize some things. There's our center dot at zero four. I need to find the focus over here and the focus over there. And that all things, the only thing I know about it is that whatever the square root of 24 is, which is like 4.9-ish, it's almost, it's almost 25. So the square root's almost five, you know, ish. Um, square root of 24. Oh yeah, that's the number of steps that it takes to get from our center to the right to get to this focus and to the left to get to that one. So our cheater's way of doing it is just to say this, the foci, this dot right here, that focus there, let's look at it. Well, the Y value is not gonna change because we're going sideways here. So it's still four steps up and I'm gonna keep the four. The X value is gonna change because I'm moving sideways. So we're gonna say it was at zero, the center was at zero, so I'll start at zero. And then if I'm going to the right, that's a plus. So I'll say plus square root of 24. And then the same thing for the left hand focus is there's still four steps up, but this one is start at zero and then minus the square root of 24. Ta-da, you know? And then you can clean those up a little bit from there, but that's essentially the idea, you know? Zero plus something is just that thing. So there are other ways to write this. You could just write this as radical 24 and that will just be negative radical 24. And then just a quick side note about that. Sometimes to get the cleanest version of the answer is you'll have to simplify that square root. And so just in case you need to do this on your test or something, square root of 24, and this works for the negative one as well. Remember, we can say, well, that's um, square root of 24, that's like two times 12, and then circle that prime factors that don't divide down anymore. This is two times six, Six is two times three. So then 24 is really composed of a two times a two times a two times a three. And in there, I'm noticing that a two times two is the same thing as a four. And the square root of four is just two. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll say, well, if the square root of two twos is just a two, I'm gonna cross out two twos inside and they become one two on the outside of that radical. It's no longer a square root part. It just is that the square root of two twos is a regular two. What's left inside is still two times three, and so that's a six. And so we have, this could be written as two radical six comma four and negative two radical six comma four for that reason, you know, or just zero plus radical 24 and zero minus radical 24 or any other variation that's related to those ideas. Okay, let's see here, scrolling along. Did we just do that one? Yeah, that's the one we just did, okay. This one, we have a hyperbola going on. Okay, 
hyperbola because it's got the negative thing going on. And the important thing to remember about that, guys, is if it's y squared minus x squared, it's one direction. If it's x squared minus y squared, it's the other way. And so let's see here. If I stretch it out, I believe, yeah, let me just make sure in my mind real quick. If the y squared went so far and then that became a negative, that means we stretched it vertically and then it did that. So yeah, this would be, if it's x squared minus y squared, it'll be like that. If it's y squared minus x squared, it'll be like that, you know? Stretching to parallel lines and then going even more extreme. Okay, and so let's see which one we have. We have a y squared take away x squared. So we're gonna have a hyperbola. It's a little bit more like an up and down one. So when we find our little box dots, we or our vertices actually, before we even do our box dots, we'll have these vertex dots that are around. And we'll be like, well, instead of connecting them to make an ellipse, we'll say, go up from the top and down from the bottom. And then we'll use the sides later on with the box, you know? So just a reminder how that goes. There we go. Um, notice there's no new zeros involved. So this thing is zero and zero are the new zeros, you know? There's no X plus this or Y minus that. So we're centered right in the middle here. And then our number of steps is very symmetrical in this case. It's five there and five there because this is like five squared and five squared. Okay, so for our steps, we have to the left and right, we're going five. That's for the X part. And for the Y part, we're also going five and that's the up and down part. Notice that the Y value is first here. There's so much symmetry involved that I, it'd be five either way, but um, watch out for that. Remember, if they put y squared first, it's still an up and down thing, even though it's first. And so anyway, five up, five down. And now that's where we'd be tempted to be like connecting the dots, but we know better because we know this is an up and down type hyperbola. So what this looks like is take it from the top. We'll get a rough cut of our drawing, knowing that it's gonna be something like this something like that but then we will refine that once we know exactly where to go but this way our minds are at least going in the right direction with it and so then we'll make some box dots and say well if i went over five and then up five i need a dot that does both so here's a dot that goes over five and up five and then here's one that's to the left five and up five and then down five to the left five and then to the right five and down five and those are our box dots and they make for our slant asymptotes on these things. And then other slant asymptote by just connecting the diagonals here, you know. Okay, that being the case, let's see here. Now we'll just trace them up. And so we'll take it from our side vertex dot, which actually doesn't get to be called a vertex right now. Oh, wait, no wonder it doesn't get to be called a vertex because I don't actually get to draw from there. It's a side, it's an up and down one. Anyway, so we use these ones, but they're called, they're not called vertices because they don't actually get to be on the drawing is the thing, you know? Anyway, so we'll take this and we'll get a better version of our drawing. We'll say from the top vertex. Now I know I'm supposed to be approximating that line. And now I know I'm supposed to be approximating that line. Same thing going on here approximate it, and what did I do? And approximate it. We're just forever approaching it, you know, getting closer to it. Ta-da, you know? And then the only thing that we haven't done with this is, well, we haven't noticed the focus dots in these ones, the vertex dots we've done. You know, we use this one and this one, and those are the vertices they want to know about. These ones are just helper dots that help us to know about the asymptotes. But then, so for our vertices, we have wherever we were, you know, I don't know what that is, zero, and then this was five, right? Oh, five, and then this one was, oh, negative five. Okay, but then the focus dots, you'll remember are on the inside there somewhere. Or is on the inside of the curve somewhere. There's one up top and one down below. I don't know how far they are, but remember there's some geometry involved in this too. And, you know, without going into the details about how it works the way it does again, uh, we didn't even have time to go over that in class actually, but it turns out that this distance to the focus 
is the same distance as it is to the box dot going diagonally. So if I can figure out a squared plus b squared equals c squared in one of my box dots, then it turns out that this c squared is the same distance that it takes to get to the focus. And so I'm going to put f for focus steps here on the hypotenuse. And you can draw your triangle differently if you like. You can go over and then up. It ends up being the same kind of stuff. Anyway, but in this case, it's totally the same because they're all fives anyway. So then we'll just say five squared plus five squared equals focus squared. In this case, the focus is playing the, the hypotenuse role instead of being a leg role in the other one in the ellipses, you know. So this is 25 and 25 makes 50. And then we'll square root that. So now we have f equals the square root of 50. That's the number of steps to get to a focus dot. So if that's how many steps it takes to get from the center to the focus dot, then that's what we're going to mention about these focus dots. Is we'll say, uh, what color shall we use? Jet black. Okay. For the focus dots, I know that my center was right here at double O, and I'm going up from there. I'm not going side to side. So my x value isn't changing, but then I'm going up square root of 50 steps. So then that's going from zero because the center was at double O, right? Zero. Okay, I'm going from on the y value from zero up to, you know, plus square root of 50. So that's zero plus radical 50. And then the, the other one, of course, will be at zero for the x value and then zero minus radical 50. I put the zero minus and zero plus because there's a chance that you might have it's something that's not a zero and you'll need to know how to format those answers. And you just put number plus that and number minus that, you know. In this case, it does simplify out. So you don't actually need the zero plus. You can just do positive and negative version of square root of 50. And again, square root of 50 simplifies out to two times five times five if you tree it all the way down, which ends up being the fives pair out. And so this is like a five on the outside with the two on the inside because a pair of fives is a five outside. So this could also be written as zero and then comma five radical two and zero comma negative five radical two. That's also another way to write it. Anyway, wanted to bring that up. Okay, boom. Now we have, what was I doing? Oh yeah, I'm not pausing the thing. Uh, yep, that's what I, okay. There we go, let's stop annotating. All right, scrolling along. Couple of things to notice here. No, not what I meant to do. Annotate, there we go. Okay, find the common difference. That means, you know, what is it that's plusing or minusing on in each one of these? This is what we call an arithmetic sequence. It's just always plusing by the same amount or always minusing by the same amount. So from four to one, that is a minus three. From one to negative two, yeah, that's minus three. Negative two to negative five, that's also going down by three. So this is the minus three is the common difference. So they say common difference, I'll just put D for common difference. That's negative three. We're adding negative three each time or we are subtracting three each time. Now there's different ways to do an explicit formula. One way that works well for what you guys are looking at is we could say, well, um, okay, how do we write this S sub n or something like that? Anyway, thinking of the sequence as a function, we could say, well, we start at the number four and then we're gonna take away a bunch of threes. And so if you're taking away a bunch of threes, the way it would look in pattern is you start with four, then you minus three off of it, then you minus three again, then you minus three again, then you minus three again. So if you're minusing the same thing over and again, that's like just timesing a bunch of negatives. So what we could do is to say, this is like plus negative three or minus of three times of n. And this kind of works. The only thing that's a little bit off about it is that you have to adjust for it. Because if I plug in, say, what I'm supposed to be able to do is plug in numbers here that'll make these numbers happen. So if I plug in, say the number one, I'm supposed to be able to get the first term to happen because this is what we call a sub one and it's a sub two and stuff like that. This is answer one, answer two, answer three. You know, that's not what a stands for, but we'll go with it. Anyway, so if I plug in the number one, I should be able to get answer one. And if I do, I don't think it quite works unless I adjust this formula because it's four minus three times one. Well, four minus three times one actually gives me four minus three, which is one as an output. That gives me the second answer. 
it doesn't give me the first answer. So I need to adjust this a little bit. You know, it's giving me answers. It's working, but it's not giving me the right ones. It's a, it's, I need to adjust it. And so what we need to do is, here's, I'll show you the teeter's trick, is we just, instead of times it by n, we'll times it by n minus one. So whatever number you're plugging in, say I'm plugging in a one, what I'm really times in by three and doing all this stuff is, and working with is the number zero, because it's one less than the number that I'm plugging in. So let's see if I put in a one, will I get answer number one here, which is four, which would be nice because that essentially means you have the four and you're taking nothing away. So zero is promising here. So let's see, four minus so three times one minus one. Well, three times one minus one is three times zero. So then four, four minus so three times zero, that does work. This is good because this is four minus nothing because three times zero is nothing. So this is the four. So we plug in our number one, I get the answer number one. If I plug in two, will I get answer number two? Let's see if it gives me, oh yeah, because that'll be a two minus one and we already did that one. So this would be four minus three times of two minus one. That's a one, three, three times one is three, four minus three is one. And now answer number two, if I plug in a two, am I getting answer number two? I sure am. So that's our trick with this one. And so to summarize that one real quick, we say start out with the starter number is four. Then if you're noticing it's minusing threes, put a minus three there and then just times it by, dig this, n minus one. Works every time. And so then you can clean that up from there. You can leave it like that if you like, or else if you want to, or if answer guy, answer key guy wants you to, you can clean it up by distributing that negative three through, you know, and stuff like that. So negative three becomes minus three n and then negative three times negative one is a plus one. So you can also call this negative three n plus five by putting the four and the one together. That also works. It's another way of looking at that same thing and whatever. We, there's ways to go directly into this form instead of that if you like, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's my take on that one. And then number 33, common ratio, find the, oh, I was supposed to find the 50 second term on that last one. Let's do that real quick, whoops. So 50 second term, this is us saying, um, I'll just say a sub n, that might be a better way to say it, uh, is gonna be equal to, start with four minus a bunch of threes, but times it by n minus one, not by n. And so if I were to try and find the 50 second term, now that I know I have the formula right, I can just plug in a 52 and then see what I can get out. And this is what we call n and a sub n or whatever, okay. And so then 52, well, I'll just shoot that in there. This is four minus of three times of 52 minus one, or in other words, 52 minus one will be a 51 plugged in, in a way, you know? So this is four minus three times of 51. I don't know what three times 51 is. It's gonna be 153. So then four minus 153, and you've got yourself a negative 149 or something like that. And then, that's what I'm getting for our 50 second term then. I plug in 52, I get out a sub n must be, or a sub 52 is a negative 149. Yeah, clear them. Okay. Now find the common ratio of the eighth term in the explicit formula. This is a geometric sequence. What you notice about this one is if I do a plus or a minus thing, it doesn't give us consistent results. From two to 10 is plus eight. But then from 10 to 50 is like a lot, plus 40, you know? From 50 to 250 is like plus 200. Like this isn't any better than the first sequence, you know? And so it's not really helping us to patternize. So we look for a timesing approach and see if that'll work, you know? And so if there's a times and divide approach, that's what we call a geometric sequence. If it's consistently timesing or dividing by the same thing. Two times five gives me to 10. 10 times five gets me to 50. This looks like it's working. 50 times five is 250. This is working. So we have a common ratio. Common ratio, we'll just call it R equals five. It's a times of a whole number of five that we need to times by each time we get to the next one. Okay. If they were getting smaller and smaller, you might have to say like one fifth or something, you know. If it was like going the other way, you know, because you're times it by a fraction at that point to get them smaller. Anyway, these are getting bigger, so it's just a times by a whole number of five networks. And then 
let's see here, an explicit formula. What if we said in this case, um, a sub n is equal to, or sorry, it's a of n or something, however you want to say it. And then we'll say, I guess we could just say a sub n is equal to, and then same idea, start with the number two, that's our start point. And then instead of plusing a bunch of things, we're timesing a bunch of stuff. So we'll say I'm timesing by a bunch of fives. But remember, there's a shortcut to say timesing a bunch of fives. Times five, times five, times five, times five, you know, et cetera. Well, timesing a bunch of stuff is the same thing as doing an exponent, you know? And so like in this case, I wrote out four of them. This would be two times five to the fourth. And so what you notice about that though is of course the number of fives is not the number of the term. Once again, it's one off because the first term doesn't have a five, all the others do. So there'll be an N minus one thing here. However many fives I wanna have, you know, that's one off from the number of term I'm looking for. So if I were to say, I got to figure out a sub eight, I'm going to be in a place where I need to be able to plug in an eight and get whatever happens eight terms down the road. And that's going to be a two and then seven fives, not eight fives, because the first term didn't have a five. Um, so our explicit formula looks like two times five to the not n, but to the, you guessed it, n minus one power. So that if I'm looking for the eighth term, it's only the seventh power of five that I'm looking for because the first term doesn't have a five. It's just the number two. Okay, so here we go. Looking for our eighth term. So we'll shoot that in there. That's gonna be two times five to the, and then sure enough, this is eight minus one, which is seven power, you know? So two times, you can just shoot that in the calculator if you like, you know, this is two times five to the seven, some big old number whatever that ends up being, two times five to the seven, big number, I don't know what it is. And that'll be our output. When we have an explicit formula and we're feeling good about it. Okay, let me see here, clear that off. <coughs> Stop the annotation for a second. I think that's the end of the road for us. Yeah, at that point, we just get into answer key stuff. Cool, let me stop the recording here. Uh, Oh, I stopped the share or something. Anyway, giddy up.